All right, everybody. Okay, we're going to do some spreadsheet stuff. So, everybody start, get your computers out. Pull up whatever spreadsheet program you have. Crazy, you're making it work. Spreadsheets more than just like using it to keep track of lists. Oh, yeah. Done some calculations. A few of you have done some some calculations. Um, all right, so we're gonna we're gonna go through spreadsheets today, and I'm just gonna warn you, I'm going to call it Excel um, because that was the only significant one um, when I got started when I was first learning this. Excel was the only spreadsheet program that anybody really cared about. Um, so I'm gonna say Excel, but I mean any spreadsheets program, and I'm gonna go through the um, the first couple, uh, the first procedure in sheets as well. So, because I think most of you are, are on either a tablet or on a Chromebook, right? And uh, Chromebooks can't use Excel. If you're trying to use Excel on a Chromebook, it'll open, but that's the web based version that doesn't actually do the things you need it to do. So, don't try to use Excel on a Chromebook, go with sheets. If you have a PC or a Mac, and you have the downloaded version of Excel, that's ideal. That's the best possible scenario. That works the best, is the most powerful, and matches the instructions perfectly. All your screenshots will look the same and everything. Using sheets, everything will work, um, but it takes a little bit of finessing in some places, and the screenshots won't match up exactly. Is that just the bell right now? I thought it started like five minutes ago. Sorry. Well, we got started early. Thank you for your patience. Um, so what we're going to start with, if you start by, uh, in addition to opening up a spreadsheet, where's the mouse? I keep using it. Um, if you, from the course schedule here, um, also another note I put, now that I'm here and you're starting to learn how to, um, to submit your assignments. I put due dates on the assignments for the last couple weeks so that they will show up in your to-do list over on the right-hand side. Um, that quiz one is that getting to know you one. What are you interested in studying in? What are you, what are you into? What do you think is cool? Give me some cool music to listen to. Um, and, but then there's the math review, the measurements lab, and the, the two homeworks, the word problems and the conversions homeworks. Um, that you've been working on the past few weeks, right? Um, so now they'll show, I put due dates on them mostly so that they'll show up in your to-do list. Um, I'm not gonna be real strict on the due dates. I just want them in by the end of next week. Uh, but ideally by the end of uh, Friday or the end of the weekend, get all of those turned in so you're all caught up and we're ready to go. Um, and in addition, the latest assignment on there down at the bottom, is our data analysis in Excel. This is what we're working on today. Um, it's due next Thursday, right? So you have, when I assign these labs, you're always gonna have a week to finish up from when we're actually doing the assignment itself. So the, in this case, it's a computer-based one, but if you're doing a wet chemistry lab where you're mixing chemicals and doing stuff, you would be taking all your data on Thursday and then you have a week to finish the write-up, answer the questions, and get it turned in. So everything's going to be due the following Thursday. Um, unless there's, for whatever reason, if you don't, if we need to take two class periods to finish a lab or something like that, that I can always change those. Um, so, you know, 
let me know, communicate if you're feeling underwater because you've got too many outstanding assignments. All of a sudden, six things showed up in your to-do list and now you're feeling panicked. Um, don't stress about it. We'll get caught up in everything. Um, and just let me know if you need if you need an extension on stuff. Um, all right, so if you open up the data analysis one, we're gonna start with this calculations intro. Uh, Tom's is making some copies right now of the procedure. You'll need that more for the second part, um, for the graphical analysis part, which is basically uh, the whole second part of this lab, the stuff you'll be doing mostly tomorrow, is how do you make charts and get equations for lines once you get into Excel. Um, that tends to be the trickier. Both of these are really useful features. And, it, and we're going to start, though, with the basics, which is anything that your TI-83 can do, Excel can do better. Um, so we're going to do some basic calculations. Um, but I say anything your TI-83 can do, Excel can do better. But why wouldn't you just want to do calculations by hand? Why would you, you need to use something like Excel? Keep track of it. It, it allows you to show your work. Um, Ren, you got to do the same thing over and over again. If you've just got one data point and you've got to do a bunch of calculations with it, but you only have to do one data point, then Excel isn't really any more valuable than a calculator. Where it's really useful is when you have 10 data points and you've got to do the same calculation 10 times in a row. I'm sure you've all had to do that in your science classes. It's no fun, right? Um, it's really mind-numbingly boring to sit there and do the exact same calculation with different numbers over and over again. That's where Excel winds up being really useful. So we're going to start do it um, with uh, with an intro on how to do that today, how to do calculations. But we're going to start by just learning how to enter data and making up some data for some students. Um, so basically, we're going to do this hypothetical class, make up five names, preferably of people that aren't in this classroom or it gets awkward when you have to start giving them grades. Um, but we're just gonna start by filling up, um, make up five students and then give them scores for quiz one, quiz two, quiz three, homework one, homework two, homework three, and a test. And then we're, gonna, we're going to find their final grade in the class after we have those numbers. So I'll make mine, yours don't have to be the same names or the same numbers obviously, um, and just because I grew up not on computers, but on binder paper, I always leave a margin off to the left, but you don't have to. You can start in A1. I always start in B2. Um, so student, homework one, homework two, homework three, quiz one, quiz two, Quiz three, exam. Um, most stuff that's pre-built, like most things generated by AI is pretty much garbage. So we don't want Google Sheets to do any of our thinking for us. Um, it's just not that good yet in most cases. So got our column headings here. Your, again, yours don't have to be in the same spots and then just make up some names. That was a good one. Bonus points if you know who that is, who those people are. If not, you have homework. It's so the classic, the classic lineup for the Stones. Mick, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, Mick Ronson, Brian Jones, and Charlie Watts. No, numbers can be different. In fact, they should be different. It'd be more interesting if they're different. Yeah. 
I think Keith Richards is probably a bad student, but good on tests and quizzes. Charlie Watts is obviously a spectacular student. All right. If you're looking at this at the uh, PDF as well, then you should all then it also has you fill out a, a points possible row. So below the student names and scores, fill out a points possible. You can make yours out of however many points you want. Um, I make this is kind of similar to the way that I actually make my assignments. Everything's either out of 10 points or 100 points um, because that makes it really easy to estimate percentages. Um, but if there was something that was a little bit different, like maybe we had a take home part of the final. And so the, the exam was actually out of 120 points. I should actually go back and change these then because then they don't make as much sense. We'll just do 100. Um, but then all the homeworks and quizzes are all out of 10 points. Um, one thing you'll also notice is that keyboard shortcuts are really, really important useful in Excel. Um, if you hit enter, you might notice that it jumps down a row. If you actually want to enter your data going sideways, left to right, like I was doing, use the tab. Left tab will actually is the same as enter, except it moves you over one column instead of down one row. And this is points possible. All right, one other thing that this will wind up being important for the second part of the assignment. And also once you get, um, once we're gonna continue using Excel in other um, applications. There'll be several of our labs where you wind up getting five data points and you'll have to plug them into Excel so you can make a chart out of it. Um, when that's the case, you have to remember that even though we care a lot about units in this class, Excel doesn't. Excel can't handle units. So you never put units on a number in Excel. You label the column instead. So if I put in, if I type nine points instead of just nine, notice how it moves to the other side of the cell. If something's aligned to the left side of the cell, that means that the spreadsheet program is interpreting it as, as text, not as a number, which means you can't do any math with it. If I wanted to say, nine points, or if I wanted to be very clear that we we're talking about points here, I would come up here to the top to the label for the entire um, column and say, in parentheses, write points, is the way you show your units in a spreadsheet, because you can't attach them to the number directly. If you try to put it attached to the number directly, you're going to have a bad time. All right. Um, next up is what do we do if we want to actually do some math here? So if we want to know the total number of homework points, I'm going to make a column that says homework points. So this is our total homework points. So if I want to know the number of points Mick has, I can add those up. Nine plus eight plus nine is 26, right? I did my math right. Yeah. So I could just do that. I can use a calculator to do that. I can, but if we want to have Excel do it for us, we need to tell Excel that we are, we're actually going to be doing some math. And here's one place where this illustrates my point that Google Sheets is thinking for us, but we don't want Google to think for us. Um, 
Have you seen some of the auto-populated AI responses from Google when you ask Google AI questions? We don't want that, right? We want them to think for ourselves. Um, and here's a prime example. We hit equals, and the first thing it says is equals sum of the entire column, the entire row. If we we're just totaling up the total number of points for everything, that would be the right formula. We don't want that though. We want equals, and we're just going to do, we're going to pick the cells that we want, and we can actually just type in, or actually, I guess the more basic one is if we just said nine plus eight plus nine. You hit equals, it tells that we're going to do math, and then you can type it in, just use it as a calculator if you want. But is that any better than a calculator? I mean, yeah, because you're using a real keyboard instead of trying to type things in on a, on a calculator. But it's not really inherently better um, until you realize you can do the same thing, but actually reference specific cells, specific boxes over here. So if instead of just typing 9 plus 8 plus 9, if I hit equals and I click on the cells that I want to add up, so C3 plus D3 plus E3. Then it does that for me. And here's where it gets really useful. And again, stop. Is that when you copy and paste a formula in one of these spreadsheet programs, it automatically shifts the cells that it references. If I copy and paste this formula, so just control C to copy and you see how you get the dotted lines around it. That just means that, I've, that I have this, cop, this formula copied right now. If I paste that to the cell directly below, it's not C3 and D3 and E3 anymore. Now it's C4 and D4 and E4, right? So this is way basically with Excel, with spreadsheets, you only need to type a formula once, no matter how many data points you have, which is good because in modern day science, our instruments take data five times a second. You wind up with data sets that are 10,000 data points. You don't want to have to type the formula by hand 10,000 times, but you can't, right? That literally would take you a whole month to type in the formula, even if it's a formula this simple. So what Excel does by automatically changing that is allows you to type the formula once, copy it, and then you select all the cells that you want that formula to be in and you paste. Control V if you're using the keyboard. Do Chromebooks have a control key, right? Okay. I know they don't have the Windows key, obviously. All right, and so and if you look down at all of these, See, that all of them are shifted. Okay, Brian's total homework points is nine plus six plus zero. It shifted that down for me. Super useful, right? So try and do that for the quizzes now. So make a column that says quizzes, quiz points. Remember equals, and this one we can actually use, if you want to add a bunch of stuff together, what's the result called when you add stuff together? Sum. If we want to sum up a bunch of things, instead of just clicking them saying E3 plus D3 plus C3, we can just type sum, and that actually calls a function, that calls a little subroutine program that runs behind the scenes in the spreadsheet programs. You type the word sum and then open parentheses. And then all you have to do is click and drag to highlight everything you want to add up. So if I wanted to add up all the quiz scores, click here, drag over. And you can see, see how it automatically populates F3 colon H3. The colon means everything within that range. If I wanted to add up the entire block of numbers, I could just select the whole block and it would read something like F3 colon H, H, whatever number we're on, whatever column or row this is 12 down at the bottom. 
All right, so then you just close parentheses, hit enter. And just like before, did I really manage to give him, I did give him the same score in quizzes and homework. I didn't mean to do that. Um, we can copy and paste now and it should update for us. So Keith and Mick Ronson both have 24 points in quizzes. Jagger has 26 points. Brian and Charlie have 19 and 29 respectively. Cool enough, right? It's a good way to do that. And again, if we wanted to, if we had 17 quizzes, we wouldn't want to click in and do quiz one plus quiz two plus quiz three 17 times. So SUM is a really useful tool that way. Um, if we want to find the percentage in the homework category, how would we do that? What? How do you find a percentage? Average? Kind of average would almost work because everything's out of 10 points. Divide by what? Total amount of points. So if you have your points, so the general form for any, for any percentage is always going to be a part divided by the total times 100. So in this case, for grades, part is points earned and total is points possible. All right, but for anything else, if you're doing like what percentage, um, if you're doing like uh, recommended daily allowances for food, I had 100 or 1,800 calories and my recommended amount was 2,000. 1,800 divided by 2,000, the part divided by the total times 100. So in this case, how would we type that in if we wanted to get our next column, it's homework percentage, how would we type that in? Again, we could do it by hand, but we don't want to. Here's our points earned. What are we going to divide by? What's our points possible for the homework category? 30. We could type 30 in and then times by 100. That gives us a percentage. However, what if I decided, oh, actually, I'm going to throw out one of the questions on, on homework three because nobody got it right. So it's not fair. I'm going to make it out of nine points instead of out of 10 points. Then I would be off by one in homework, right? And then I would have to go back and I'd have to fix my homework equation which is doable, but I don't have a whole lot of faith in my ability to remember to do that necessarily. So if I want this to update itself, then instead of typing in over 30, I can do J3 divided by J8, right? Times 100. 100 is never going to change, so we can type the 100 in. It's a percentage, right? What does percent mean? What, what does the word percent literally mean in Latin? Anybody have an idea? Close. It means cent is for 100, right? Just like pennies, cents. Um, what does per mean? But what is break per down? Give me a different definition of per. That's a tricky one, right? Like miles per hour, what does per mean? For every. So percent literally means for every hundred. So the hundred is never going to change in percent. So we can type the, the hundred times 100 in here and just leave it in there. But if points possible might change, we might want to, um, we might want to have that coded. So then if I come back here to homework three, let's say I made homework three out of nine points, it automatically updated homework points possible and up automatically updated this percentage, right? Make one change and everything else that depends on that also changes. But I don't really actually want it out of nine points because that the asymmetry of that would bother me. So we'll make it out of 10 points still. And is there a way to round it? There, yes and no. 
there is, but it's a more complicated. You wind up having to use some programming word words like um, like floor is the command that actually gets called to round it if you want it to round down. Um, you can make it display fewer numbers just by right clicking on it. And again, I'm not in Excel, but there's a way to change the the format so that it only shows a couple of decimal points. Um, but again, it but it will actually keep all of them um, and only show you some. So it doesn't truly round it. It just makes it look rounded. Okay. Um, oh, there, up here. There's a button in Sheets. So you could de decrease decimal points if you wanted, but it still keeps them all. It just doesn't show you them. All right, so if I copy and paste this, we should be able to, to get our percentage for everybody, right? What happened? What do you suppose that error means? Divide by zero? That's not a good sign, right? We know we can't do that. So if anytime you get an error like this where one of them looks good, but the other ones don't, click on this one and it actually shows function divide parameter two cannot be zero. In other words, you're not allowed to divide by zero. If you double click on the cell, it'll actually show you what the formula is again. Look what happened. When we copy and pasted it, J3 shifted to be J4, which is what we wanted, but J8 shifted to be J9 and there's nothing there. Now we could do something like write 30 a whole bunch of times in a row down here, but that doesn't really solve the real issue, right? There are some times where you wanna copy and paste a formula where you want some of the cells to change, but not all of them. Any of the cells that you want to stay constant when you copy and paste, you just tell the, the spreadsheet program that it's gonna stay a constant. And you do that by using dollar signs. If you've got a keyboard that has um, the F keys across the top, F, if you hit F4, it'll automatically add two dollar signs, dollar sign J, dollar sign eight. You don't have F keys across the top of your keyboard. You just add them by hand, dollar sign J or whatever, whatever one you're trying to keep constant. The dollar sign is the signal to sheets Hey, don't change this when I copy and paste. And now, so now when I copy and paste, I, and I don't want to put the dollar signs on, on the J3. I want J3 to change, right? But I don't want J8 to change. So now when I copy and paste, we get real numbers. Right, and if we look down here at the bottom row, J7 divided by dollar sign J, dollar sign eight, dollar sign J, dollar sign eight didn't change. That's what we wanted. So do it for the quizzes now. It's gonna be really similar for the quizzes, right? Still three data points, still got your quiz points. You got your quiz points possible. You're still going to be multiplying by 100. You try and write that one before I do. All right, so formula should look something like this. Maybe not K, maybe not three, but quiz points divided by quiz points possible, dollar signs times 100. 
I don't think we're having baseball practice tonight. <laughs> I don't have any sway over the football team, but. <laughs> All right. Can I ask us something? You don't need to do the uh, the time on under. You just uh, press the um, send key. Yeah, yeah, you can. I don't trust that button because there's some weirdness. Is it going to just display it as a percentage, or is it going to actually make it a percentage number, or is it going to still be the fraction just displayed as a percentage? So. Basically, it. I do it this way because I don't. Excel and Sheets both try to think for you when you try to when you tell it you're using percentages, and I don't want that. I want the raw numbers. Okay. So I would avoid using that. But that said, maybe I'm just old fashioned and it's gotten better. All right, here's a here's a bonus. Can you write one equation that you can copy and paste into both columns? Close. Well, we're going to do that next. So this one we we said dollar sign j dollar sign eight because we wanted to keep the we wanted to keep it constant, right? Well, do we really need to keep it constant when we copy and paste in? in the um, homework percentage, or do we just need to keep the row constant? We need to keep the row constant, not the column. So if we write this without the dollar sign in front of the J, got too zoomed in here. See how it, now, when I copy and paste from left to right, it let the K, the K change when I copy and paste it to the next column over, J changed to K, but it, now when I copy and paste up and down, it'll keep the eight constant. But that is really splitting hairs. That is not everybody who uses Excel, even uses Excel at a pretty high level necessarily needs to know how to do that. You can always use double dollar signs into, if you're sure, if you're not sure what you need to keep constant, what you want to change. Also, and this can be really helpful. You can see, especially as I'm zoomed in, we can't see the students' names and we're not, this really matters in this case, these are made up students, right? But let's say I wanted to keep it so that I could see um, the, and actually I'm going to move everything up into the, into the left one spot so that I can have everything all the way in the top right corner. Um, if you want to keep it so that you, so that the first column in the first row, you can see both of those at all times, basically make it so that they don't move when it scrolls, go up to view and freeze. You can freeze one row and freeze one. Column. So those now all of a sudden when I go from left to right, see how it keeps the students right there. And if I had 30 students and I couldn't see them all, if I was scrolling all the way down, it would make it so that I could still see the um, the assignment titles, even if I was all the, if I scrolled all the way down. Minor points, but for those of you who wind up dealing with larger data sets at some point, that'll wind up being a really useful tool. All right, what's the next thing it has us calculate? Anybody have that PDF up? We want to do, we got quiz percentages, homework points, homework percentages. We want the final grade. So the final grade, this is much like your final grade. It's going to have three categories. The three categories are, are quizzes, assignments, or quizzes, homework, and uh, exams. So in this case, 
if the fictional class is 50% homework, 20% quizzes, 30% exam, how do you find your final grade from what we have? We have the grade in the quiz category. We have the grade in the homework category. We have the exam grade. How do we get a final grade? So 50% homework, 20% quizzes, 30% exam. How do you calculate that? Anybody know? No? If they were all the same, how would you do it? Any ideas? You would times it all, add it all together, divide by three. You just take the average if they were all the same, right? This type of, of system is called a weighted average. We're going to take the average of it, but we're not going to divide everything by three. Or another way of thinking about divide, instead of thinking about it as dividing by three, you can think about it as multiplying by a third. A third of the grade comes from one, a third comes from the other, a third comes from last. If they're all the same weight, you use the same number in front of each of them, right? They're not all the same weight though. So what are we going to do? Instead of a third times homework, it's going to be what? Half, 0.5. Instead of a third times quizzes, it's going to be 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Yeah. So one uh, chemistry connection with this is when you find average mass of right. ice, you look at how, how commonly the ice is occurred. Yeah, so there's a lot of places weighted averages show up. Grades is one of them. It's going to show up for everybody again, no matter what, because a lot of um, classes do this. But in chemistry specifically, the atomic masses on the periodic table are weighted averages where you take the probability of finding a certain isotope times the weight of that isotope, and then you add all the results together. In this case, we're gonna take the weight in each category times the grade in that category and add them all together. So our final grade is gonna be 0 0.5 times your homework percentage plus 0 0.2 times quizzes plus 0 0.3 times exam percentage. When we add those all up together, we get our final grade. So now that we have this written out, now that we have a plan, this is another tip in Excel that could be really helpful is knowing how to type it into Excel to get it to do the right math is tricky sometimes. So sometimes it can be helpful to do the math once by hand on paper, the way you would write it for a math class and then translate that into Excel. Sorry, spreadsheets. So what that would look like here, first off, do we have exam percentage as a category? Do we need it? Not as long as you made your exam out of 100. If you made your exam out of 100 points, then your exam score is the exam percentage, right? If we did something like make it out of 150 points, then we would have to have an exam category or exam percentage category as well. So equals 0 0.5 times homework percentage plus 0 0.2 times quiz percentage plus 0 0.3 times exam score. Unsurprisingly, as, as mixed grade in homework and quizzes and the exam were all about 86, his final grade is 86 ish. That was Totally by chance, I did not plan that. We copy and paste that formula down and our formula and it shifts downward. We know we did it right. 
because our final grade, if we take, treat the points possible, like it's actually somebody's score, points possible should give you 100%, right? So if you did it right, this should be 100, and you should get numbers up here that are kind of like, that are similar to the percentage scores up above. <laughs> Which one is saying error? You gotta make sure it's not parentheses. Oh, yes, it does not know how to interpret. Thank you. Um, parentheses as if you did this instead of using the asterisk, the way I have it written on the board, it doesn't know to do that to treat that as multiplication. So you have to explicitly say multiply or you'll get an error. And that's part of what I mean by write it out the way you would write it for a math class and then translate it. I didn't even think about that because I've been doing this long enough and teaching this class long enough that I know that I just put the asterisk in. I didn't think to do it like that. All right. Any questions so far? Everybody with me? So in sheets, if you're in Excel, then you you select the, the cells and you right click and go to format cells. And one of the options is you can tell it what type of data you have there. Um, in sheets, select these. And then at the top, one of these button is increase decimal places or decrease decimal places. And if you hit decrease decimal places, and go back and forth till you get to show as many as you want. But again, that doesn't actually affect the number as far as if you did further math with it, it would keep all of those decimal places. It just affects what it shows you. Who here is taking stats? A few people. Who remembers two-tailed t-tests and z-scores and things like that? I'm not going to make you do any of that math, um, but these spreadsheet programs have those functions built in as well. So if you wanted to do a test for statistical significance, you don't need to type it into your TI-83 and do a little list and have it do that. You can actually do a two-tailed t-test um, right from here. Usually, and again, equals t-test, returns the probability associated with t-test, open parentheses, and then it'll have you select your data, select your mean, all that stuff. Um, so when I say anything your TI-84 can do, this can do better. That's what I mean. You can do all of that statistical analysis in Sheets and, or in Excel, um, which is really handy to not have to go type everything. Anybody, you know, Remember typing all those things into a list in, in uh, a TI-83 and then having to go and run through all the menus. Uh, it's a huge pain. The... All right, last thing on this one. If we wanted to find the average of any of these, Average is another one of those functions that's built in here. So is median. If you wanted to find the median score versus the average score of mean, um, you can do that. And like most of these, these functions, if you want to find the average of a bunch of numbers, you start by just hitting equals and type the word average. So in this case, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to type equals for the first one because that's just my label. If I hit equals, average, open parentheses, and then all you have to do is click and drag. I want to average up those five data points. Don't let Excel or don't let Sheets think for you though, because did you see what it did the, when I first did that? It said B2 to B7. If I do that, I included the points possible. 
be sh we don't want to include points possible in our average because that's not an actual score from a student, right? We only want to include the student scores. So we want to go B2 to B6. And then as before, once you do that, you can copy and paste. And we get an average for the total final grade average of 78.6 for this group of delinquents. We can do better than that. You'll do better than that. All right, questions? Everybody feel okay? I feel like you could do basic calculations even if you don't know all the functions yet. We'll learn those as you go. Um, then we're going to continue on and where I will see we have till 235, right? A couple minutes, uh, 240. Thank you. If we come back to the, to the assignment here. So that's the end of this one is it says, um, find the average for all the data points. And then to, you can save this file, um, base, but you can't, so when you submit stuff on Canvas, um, you can't just give me the link to the Google Sheet because if you do that, then it that then unless you've given me permissions to access your Google Drive, I can't actually see what you did. So you actually have to download it as a file, which you can usually you can do from up here. File, um, download. Just download it either as a PDF or as an Excel sheet. Either one works. Um, but you can also just leave it for now. You can save it and then turn it all in as one file because you can add another sheet. We have another. Uh... Oh, I couldn't see it. The lighters were in the way. Thank you. Um, and now we just have a, a blank one. We can start from scratch. So everything's all in one file. Then you only have to upload one file at the end. Um, keeps it cleaner. You can do it all as it's going to wind up being several different files if you do it, if you don't keep adding sheets, um, which is fine, but this way makes more sense to me. It's good functionality enough. All right. So the data analysis part. Sometimes for data analysis, you do some calculations with some stuff. You take some raw data, you find the average of data points, or you um, you have to you know convert it from Celsius to Fahrenheit or something like that before you can actually plot it on a graph that you want. Um, and that's where where the calculations come in. But the other part of this is almost never in the sciences do we actually report anything as just a table full of numbers. Table full of numbers is not really that easy to see what's going on, right? You always take, if you have a table full of numbers, first thing you do is you try to make it something that people can look at and visually see what's going on, right? So that's what the next part of this lab is. How do you take a bunch of raw data and put it into a form where we can actually see some things, do some math with it? And that mostly involves making charts. Um, and the one I will, um, the uh, the instructions are pretty pretty good for the uh, if you follow the procedure um, for Excel here. There's just a few things that I will show you here. I'm going to make up some data again um, to show you how to how to uh, insert a chart in Sheets because it is a little different. Um, so let's see. So let's say we had five data points and. So let's say we have this some data points and we're trying to make this column our X axis and this column our Y axis. Um, if we wanna insert a chart, we go to this conveniently labeled menu at the top, insert. We're going to, and you find chart. 
The trick is you have to get the right type of chart. Remember how I said that when uh, when Sheets tries to think for you, it, it never gets it right? Um, charts, it always assumes that you're a business major. Um, it always tries to get you to do economic analysis of things. That's not what we're doing here in the sciences, right? So the only type of chart we're going to use in this class is called a scatter chart. A scatter chart specifically means we want to give it the X's and the Y's that go with those X's. All of the economic ones, all the line charts and bar charts and pie charts, they all only deal with one variable at a time. In the sciences, we're using, we're looking at X's and Y's. So it has to be a scatter chart. You have to be careful because there are some charts that look like scatter charts. Like that looks like it could be like an X and a Y chart, but that's a line chart. That's actually an area chart, but we want the scatter chart. The icon looks like this. It looks pretty similar in Excel as well. A scatter chart in allows us to specify what's the X and what's the Y. So once you change it to a scatter chart, the options over here on the right-hand side, you've got X axis and you've got series. You need to make sure that we add the right one. So when you click on add X axis, it gives you this dialog box here. And all that means, it says select a range. You can type it in by hand or you can click and drag the X's and it fills it in for you. Sheet two, exclamation point, B3 to B7. That's what we want. And then we want our series is going to be our Y values. We get something that looks pretty close to a straight line. If we did it right, then our X values should match up. That looks like one, three, five. That's right on the line for eight. That's right on the line for 14. If you just put this in as a line chart, or if it didn't, if it didn't read the X axis properly, these would all be equally spaced from each other. We don't want that. They need to have the right X value. All right, and then the other thing that it, that uh, the, um, the chart ask the other lab will ask you to do is to find is to um, add a trend line. A trend line is just this is a, also known as a linear regression line or a line of least squares. Basically, it's, it's gonna try and draw a line that matches this data. This data is already pretty linear, right? So an, a regression line or a trend line is just gonna draw a line and give us the equation for it that allows us to, um, so we have a, a y equals slope times x plus an intercept form. All right, and the way you do that, and now we're getting to the edge of my abilities in Sheets because I don't know Sheets as well. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. So you go over to Customize and then go to Series. And one of the options at the bottom is Trend Line. You see how I just drew a line on there. If we want to know what the equation for that line is, when you come down, where you come down here to Label, you say use equation and it says 2.09 times X plus negative zero two point or 0.249. That's our Y equals MX plus B form. And if we want to, the you usually also need to show the R squared. R squared is, I made my data really linear. I didn't mean to make it that linear. Um, R squared is really close to one. Let me make my data not so good. Um, There we go. So now it shows, see how the R squared, it changed the equation of the line a little bit. The R squared is 0 0.998. R squared is a measure of how linear your data is. If you got a perfectly linear set of data, like I started with, R squared is one. More likely, this is still really close to linear. So point, anything above R squared of 0 0.9 is pretty good for chemistry. If you get an R squared that's down in the like the 0 0.6, 0 0.7 range, that's not very linear. Your data is pretty random. If you get an R squared of 
that's about the same as just saying random random dots scattered on on you know if you just threw a handful of rice at graph paper. Um, that's that's what your data looks like. That'll give you an R square of 0.5. Okay. All right. So that that is the bulk of what you're doing for the report. Here it has, gives you, if you read through the procedure, it gives you a bunch of cases. Here's some data, do some statistical analysis on it or plot it. Uh, and all of it can be done in Excel. The one thing this is the last thing to go over um, is it has you calculate standard deviation by hand. Anybody ever done that before? It's no fun. Um, this will be the only time I ask you to do that. Normally, when you get a bunch of data and ask you for the standard deviation, you just use Excel to find the standard deviation. Excel has our in sheets have a program built into it that'll find the standard deviation for you. Um, and it's pretty straightforward. If I want to know the standard deviation of the Y values here, I hit equals STDEV. And then you select your data. Boom, gives me the standard deviation. There's my standard deviation. To do it by hand is, is rather complicated. So the formula for standard deviation, let's see if I can do this from memory, square root of sigma xi minus x bar squared over n minus 1. So basically, if you're finding standard deviation by hands, who has seen sigma notation before? What does it mean? Uh, so it's like there's some it's like sum it's like the sum function in, in sheets right um it just means you're going to go through every one of your x values and every one of your values and you're going to find how far it is from the average so x1 minus the average and then take that that difference and square it and then you do the same thing for x2 for your second data point how far is it from the average take that difference square it get all of the squares. So if you have five data points, you do that five times. X1 minus the average, square it. X2 minus the average, square it. X3 minus the average, square it. Five times the X5 minus the average, square it. Add all of those together, all five of those differences squared together. And this equation is written in the, the um, PDF as well, in the procedure. Um, and once you have those squares all added up, you divide by your number of data points, which is n minus one. And take that answer and square root it. And that's your standard deviation. You can see how if you get the data set larger than five, that's a, that's a hassle to keep track of all that, right? Again, it's where Excel is really useful, repetitive calculations over and over again or even just, it has this e entire equation programmed into it. All you have to do is hit, like I showed up there, equals average or equals standard deviation, All right? So it'll have you do this by hand once to show me that you understand what a standard deviation is. Anything for the rest of this class where I ask you to do the standard deviation, use sheets. Don't do it by hand again. Do it by hand just the once to show me you can, all right? All right, and that's almost all the time we have. We have 10 minutes left. Try and make one chart before you leave today. Try and do the first part of that procedure so you get some practice making your own chart and yours won't be these numbers, right? So check your procedure, try and do part A. And I'm gonna walk around and check on everybody. Thank you.